Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. I'm Marty Calabrese, a naturalist with Cleveland Metro Parks out of North Sugar and Nature Center. Thank you for choosing to spend your time with me this evening. Tonight's topic, maple sugaring. Shall we proceed? The video and microphone on your end are going to remain off. Should you have any questions or you want to say hello from your part of the country or the state of Ohio, you may find and use the chat feature. Maple sugaring 101. Let's do it. Let's see how this 93 million mile away star charges these trees and drives photosynthesis that combines CO2 and water and spits out oxygen and glucose. And some of that glucose builds the sweetener in sap, which through a process refined through millennia produces the best of syrups, maple syrup. No, no, not corn syrup. Sorry, pure maple syrup. And in this case, it is from Vermont. Take a look at the ingredients, Vermont organic maple syrup. And right beneath that, I know that's got to be teeny. It says refrigerate after opening. That's a good sign, actually. That is a good sign. And like honey, the FDA considers maple syrup to be a single ingredient product. Actually, another good sign. If you look on the right, uh, the ingredients there, raw wildflower honey. Beautiful, pure. So how does it work? That's what we're going to talk about this evening. We're going to talk about where to find the right tree what to do with that tree and how you can collect sap and and turn it into something heavier darker stickier sweeter from sap to syrup again all made possible by that star the sun find your way to a floodplain habitat so you take a look at this forest here these trees definitely have their feet wet now that's a little flooded but i really wanted to drive the point home the species in a floodplain habitat, that is land, neighboring, a river or a creek, a stream, those trees can, those species can tolerate wet soils, wet soils year round. So it doesn't mean that it's standing water, but it does mean that it can flood with rain events if the creek or the river overflows. So this is typical of a floodplain habitat. So if you're doing maple sugaring, or you're visiting the Cleveland Metro Parks Maple Sugaring event, wear your boots. Wear those rubber boots if you have them. Can get a little muddy, especially if they're snowing and the snow melts during the day, because that's the right recipe, right? Cold at night, warm during the day. And if you find your way to some trees, they're not going to have leaves this time of year. That's the time of year you do maple sugaring. This is when the farmers historically and now are going to have a hard time growing any other crop right in this part of the world this region and the leaves don't have trees so they turn to maple sugaring turning sap into something sweeter to syrup so as we look at these two trees right here on the right side we have this cucumber magnolia take a look as it grows it grows, sends down a twig, and then brrr, sends a twig right there. And what I'm showing you here is an alternate growth pattern. Now, if we look over on the left to this honeysuckle, uh, to this honeysuckle, each of those what look to be leaflets, those are actually leaves. And I'm going to circle an intersection there. It's an opposite growth pattern. Opposite growth pattern. The, each of the leaves are growing opposite of each other, and this is typical and usual throughout the plant. And that's how it is with a sugar maple. That's the tree species that has the sweetest sap. So it's two or three percent sugar in that sap. The rest of it is actually water. More on that later. So we're looking at these growth patterns, alternate on the right, and uh, that was opposite on the left. Thanks for the question there, Alex and Andrew. Uh, Mr. Marty, will you be doing more Ask a Naturalist? Well, that's something that it's always, that's always coming at us naturalists at Cleveland Metro Parks. I presume you mean on Facebook Live. I do know I have a Facebook Live. I'm coming to you guys with some signs of spring on March 12th on Cleveland Metro Parks 
Facebook and we'll go from there, okay? And should you have any questions, feel free to submit those and I'll address those live. Sugar maple, here it is, the species. Uh, let's start with the leaf, okay? Bottom left, it's a simple leaf, it's a big leaf. I mentioned it's a problem. This time of year, there's no leaves on the deciduous trees and a sugar maple is a deciduous tree. It loses its leaves every year. It's a hardwood, so it's gonna be a, a high density wood. Its growth factor is, it has this number assigned to it. So based on how quickly it grows wide, it's got a number, that number is five. I'll mention that later with more context. I mentioned its leaf arrangement is opposite. And again, it's a simple leaf, but it does have lobes that, I would say five lobes. Take a look at the leaf and you're seeing all sorts of points. Well, each lobe has, uh, is divided by a sinus and throughout the margin, the edges of that leaf, it has points. So it can be a little confusing, but if you were to round out those points, ultimately there's gonna be five lobes. To the right of that leaf, that's the samara, the, the fruit. And that too is not going to be there this time of year. And it's also a difficult way to identify maples. The, the you know, silver maple might have a similar fruit. The, the Norway maple has those two connected fruit, but they're wider. It's just tricky unless they're side by side. What I really wanna draw your attention to actually on this slide is the, the, on the top right, you'll see the buds of a sugar maple. Compare that to the one with the, the red circle with the line through it. That's from a red maple. And with the growing degrees, that the growing degree days, the number of sort of uh, warm days uh, that we've had so far this late winter, right around the corner, I'm talking like 10 days from now, that we're gonna start to see red maples bud, potentially. Um, first, it's gonna be silver maple. I'll give it how about 10 days before silver maple, and then another 10 after that before red maple. Now, why does this ma matter? Because you might misidentify a sugar maple for a red maple, and you wanna make sure that you are collecting sap like we do at Cleveland Metro Parks from 65 trees this year, you wanna make sure that you're connecting to a sugar maple. So what you can see this time of year, often too late, but uh, are the buds. And take a look at the top right, that is your sugar maple bud. All right, where, where do they grow? Well, I know we have some folks from Tennessee and South Carolina as I look down here on the USDA map, and what do you know, you do have that species. You do have sugar maple, but what you don't have are the very cold nights like we're experiencing right now in Cleveland. We're dipping below 32 degrees Fahrenheit and we are above 32 degrees Fahrenheit right now, this time of year. That's what drives the pressure inside of the tree, the positive pressure to squeeze out the sap where there's an incision, okay? so. The range on the right is where the maple sugar can take place. Notice that it's smaller and it does include Ohio and it drives right up into Canada. And you know Canada does this very well. Let's talk a little bit about what we know, what we think we know here about the history of maple sugaring. So how did this come about? Well, the Native Americans, the American Indians, figured out that if you cook sap and you get rid of the water through steam, the sap gets sweeter. And they may have set up a camp, a, a sort of a campsite here, a temporary hut called a wikiup, similar in nomenclature to a wigwam. And they would use, they did not have metal, okay, they did not have plastic, so they would use wood spiles. A spile is the tube it's the straw, it's the connector into the tree. So a little bit of sap can spill out, drip out like you're seeing on the right and be collected. Their spiles could be from certain species of shrubs and trees that you can, you can knock the pith out, the center out, and that way it becomes a straw. Oh, apologies for using my a photo of me here, but I really wanna drive the point home and how hard this is. So. Here I am with a fire behind me. 
inside of that fire, I had rocks, hard rocks, hard rocks, like granite, igneous rocks, okay? Nothing soft and brittle that would fall apart in the fire with water inside. Anyways, I take the rock, it's hot, and I drop it inside of this hollowed out log full of a little bit of sap, and it goes, and that sap starts to heat up and, and steam off some water, and that's good. It's getting sweeter. Is it making syrup, though, right off the bat? No, this would take a while, and it does. I've tried. I've tried for a while, and it takes a long while, and you know what happens to your sap? It gets dirty, but the American Indians, they really were working on that sweetener. They needed a sweetener. What they did not have is uh, sugar cane. So they did not have the white sugar. 1619 is the year that sugar cane came over. And I'll tell you what, the colonists, so I've read, weren't so good at growing sugar cane here on the mainland of what we now call the United States. So we did not have sugar. And with European settlement, some other things came over, more on the materials in a minute, but I do want to mention those of you who are thinking, what about honey? What about honey in the, in the back of your heads? Well, the year 1622, honeybees were brought over uh, first on the East Coast. And yes, honey started to come around, but it was not, it was not uh, to the level that maple sugaring was at. And maple sugaring with maple sugar, and you can also continue to boil that syrup and make it into, it sort of crystallize it, make it into a sugar, getting rid of more and more water. So if you were to try and make maple syrup and you got rid of too much water and it started to harden and crystallize, that's when you're getting into that sugar stage. And it's a good way to preserve it and transport it. With the European settlement, we have new materials like metal coming on over and they really increased production. Peak production was 8.2 million gallons of syrup and 40 million pounds of sugar in the year 1860. It's really a game of technology here, moving from that, uh, the wood only to metal. How might they use the metal? Take a look at this bucket here that some of us call it Cleveland Metro Parks the pioneer buckets you see this bucket i i have it here hanging from a sugar maple and it's wood slats wood wood slats there strapped together with metal that is one way to use metal you can make a bucket and a bucket is small you can carry it it's not like a hollowed out log or something heavy that would get saturated and that's just simply heavy because it's huge this wooden bucket with the metal straps is good however it is made of wood don't you think it might leak a little bit and it does and i'd throw a lid on top of that too that would really help coopers that was the name of the folks the craftsmen that would make those buckets take a look at the lower right and i have here an iron kettle and these photos are from the sugar bush at cleveland metro park the sugar bush is what you call the collection of sugar maple trees that you're collecting sap from, turning into that syrup. The iron, as I mentioned, is this one, but copper would have been used as well. How does this all work? Yeah, there we go. It's photosynthesis, of course, so we're going to back it up here for a second. I mentioned the sun, all right? Photosynthesis converts energy-poor compounds like CO2 and water into energy rich compounds like sugar and oxygen. And specifically, here's the equation solar energy is absorbed by chlorophyll and converted into chemical energy. And the water is split into oxygen and, and hydrogen. Okay. And then the carbon dioxide is split into sugar. I can interpret this pretty well because I've seen it a lot but I know this is uh, fresh for some of us. Take a look at that glucose, C6H12O6. It's good stuff. It's, it's, it's what we need, it's what we love about plants. All right, when does this happen? Well, I was mentioning this time of year is great for collecting, hey, what's that robin doing there? If you've heard any robins outside, some say that when you start to hear the robins sing, that it's a good time to start tapping those trees and maybe the sap is flowing. 
when you start to hear the robins sing, the American robins. So February for us at our latitude in the Cleveland area, the Cuyahoga County area, the Geauga County area in Northeast Ohio. And that's when we are tapping the trees. And in late February, um, early March, well, let's see what's today. It's March 4th. We have our maple sugaring event at Cleveland Metro Parks in two days. And we predicted quite well we're going to have the taps like you see here on the right, the, the spile, it's going to start to drip and some of them already have around this area. We do have spiles that are dripping because we've had days that are warmer than the evening. So days that are above 32 degrees Fahrenheit and nights that are below. Now, University of Vermont found that in the maple sugaring season starts eight days earlier and ends approximately 12 days later than it did 50 years ago. They also found that the transition from winter to spring is much shorter. And that's a time that, that's a time that represents 10% of the sugaring season. Again, this is a study at University of Vermont. Vermont is a real heavy hitter in the United States when it comes to maple syrup, uh, the number one producer, in fact, of these states in the US. You better have a lot of wood because that's the the most common way to heat that sap. You're going to cook it. You're going to cook it for a long time and you're going to cook it hot and you need to keep, you know, you need to have a safe way to heat it outside and um, you're going to something with ventilation and you're going to need to keep that, keep that fire going. So March, the sap's flowing. These buckets can drip. 30 that spile there can drip 30 300 times i should say 300 times a minute if it's really flowing and that that bucket could fill in under 24 hours and for us again that is march it's the beginning of march it's the earlier side of march and this is what our buckets this is what we use 1875 all right with the civil war wrapping up uh, came the production, the introduction of sheet metal and metal that I should ask, does anybody out there know what it's called? If you have metal, like sheet metal, that doesn't rust. So there's this process and you throw some zinc on top of that metal and you embed it in there and then it prevents rusting. So these buckets have had that process done to them here at Cleveland Metro Park and they are decades old. And we have been tapping these trees at the sugar bush in Rocky River Reservation since the early 1980s, I believe. I don't remember the actual year. It was just a baby. All right, moving forward here. Yeah, so, I, I mean, this is great here. You see that sun? And I position this bucket so that it's on the side of the tree where the sun is coming up. So that sun nails that side of the tree first, gets the juices flowing. So you start to get an early drip, even when the top of the bucket it has a little bit of snow and some frost on it. Sometimes the positioning can come in handy. More on tapping here in a little bit. Well, when you, when you have all these buckets hanging from all these trees, you need to have friends and volunteers and staff, like one of my coworker naturalists here, collecting that sap. So you have that sap and you, you take it off the tree in the bucket, you pull back that lid, Oh, somebody, thank you, Deborah, galvanized. You're right, those buckets have gone through galvanization so they don't rust. You slip the lid off and those lids are handy so uh, it can prevent you know, snow and rain and maybe droppings from a bird or, or keeping a thirsty uh, raccoon out of there. You pour them into these larger buckets and then you, oh boy, you have a long ways to go. You gotta carry it without spilling it, all that stuff, and you gotta get it back somewhere. You get it back to the sugar house. So we also have a few, and it is uh, a, quite common to see these bags. This is plastic, all right? So a newer material, that, again, I mentioned earlier, this with materials, it's really a game of technology here that's improved the efficiency. So with the plastic, you have these bags, the bags do not collect as much. So it's fewer gallons, but the bags are narrow when they're not in use, they're light, they're hard to clean. 
They have a built-in lid. It's easy to pour out the sap from the side. You just grab one of those holes at the bottom and you swing that bag over and the sap spills out into one of those orange buckets there. Problem is, it is plastic. It's a plastic bag. So what happens at night during maple sugaring? Well, again, it freezes. It's below 32 degrees and if sap is mostly water, sap can freeze. And what happens to water when it freezes? It expands. So on occasion, we do have a leaking bag. We've got to get all that sap back to the sugar house. As I mentioned, we have our volunteers here that are super helpful. And another naturalist on the top left, she's demonstrating the use of a yoke. So you can split the weight of two buckets. Sap, since it's mostly water, it weighs what water weighs, which I believe is about eight pounds per gallon. So let's say you have two gallons of sap on the left, two gallons of sap on, on her right. That's over 30 pounds. Yeah, that's going to be pretty heavy. And what happens here with the yoke, you put it around your shoulders and then you end up, it, it's your bones carrying that weight mostly instead of your muscles. And your bones don't get as tired as quickly as our muscles. Isn't that right? And we have, uh, again, these volunteers, they're a lot of help. How about this? How about this? With plastic, we can connect two trees and drop it into one bucket. That's efficiency right there, folks. And you need a larger bucket. The tubes are plastic. The spiles are plastic. The tubes can be tricky to clean. And this is just a demonstration here. And it really gets flowing when it does, when you've connected two trees. And we do only put, at Cleveland Metro Parks, one cap or hole in a tree. More on that in a minute. And we also remove that spile after the sugaring season. So, you know, middle of March, late March, we're pulling that spile out of the tree and the tree begins its healing process. Take a look at this. I mean, wow. Can you imagine how much sap is flowing through those tubes? So they've connected all these trees and they're using gravity. You'll notice it's slanted downward to the left. That's called a drop. You want to look for a good drop. Now, I'm not teaching you how to do this tonight. We're sort of looking at this as fans of maple sugaring, as tourists of maple sugaring. There's an Ohio State talk coming up on March 12th. I'll plug that later. It's a webinar, and they're going to teach us how to do it, should you want to try it at home on your own property or maybe on your farm. And we've got, I, okay, here, now take a look at this. The gauge, the width, the size of these tubes is getting wider and wider because there's more sap flowing through it. You don't want that sap to freeze. It's flowing downhill to the sugar house. Now, it, take a look on the right. Can you see they've tapped, they've tapped one tree twice. So they have put two spiles into one tree. We put one, we tap a tree one time if its diameter is greater than 12 inches. Now they're doing two taps here, which means that tree is at least 18 inches in diameter. Now how do you know? I mentioned that sugar maples are a hardwood. There's a growth factor assigned to several species of trees, several species of interest, like a sugar maple. The growth factor is five. So it's interesting. You can figure out, you, someone can tell you, oh, you want to find a tree that's 50 or 60 years old before you tap it. You can, can figure out how old a sugar maple is by wrapping its circumference and dividing by pi. So you, you, you wrap the tree, you see if it's a little over 36 inches in circumference, uh, roughly at your chest height, and then you divide that by 3.14, and if it equals 12, that means you have a 12 inch diameter tree. And that's what we need. We only tap the trees that are, again, bigger than one foot in diameter. And at that point, they're 50 or 60 years old. So sort of a relatively slow growing tree in its maturity. And that's typical of hardwoods. It sort of makes sense, right? The wood is of a higher density than a fast growing pine or something like that. Here we go. It's going to the sugar house. And this is actually the sugar house right here at Cleveland Metro Parks. Bottom right, you'll see what it looks like before we set it up. <laughs> and then, boom, we transform it into the sugar house. That's where the magic happens. 
you'll see something's coming out of the top. What is that? Do sap suckers eat the sap? Interesting question. Yellow-bellied sapsucker is a woodpecker, a migratory woodpecker in this region of the United States. They will, yeah, they will certainly enjoy sap and bugs from trees. Okay, but no, they're not. They're not flying up to a bucket of sap and taking a sip. Huh, that would be funny if we saw that. Here's what's going on inside of the sugar house. We've got this big. A big, heavy, hot fire inside of there, and it is underneath the evaporator pan. What's coming off through my hand right there? Well, it's not smoke. Within that evaporator pan is sap, so that is steam coming out. That is water coming right out. So with my hand above that, my hand and gloves are getting wet, and it's hot. And I'm right above that evaporator pan right there. And that's the name of the game. You want to start to get rid of all that, all that water. So here's, we're looking through the cupola at the top here of that sugar house, the cupola. And we are seeing the hot steam, not smoke, but oh, there's, some, there's some smoke coming out too. But, but we're seeing a lot of steam coming out of there. And we sort of want to control that water. It can get very wet. And this is why you do this outside and not in your kitchen on the stove. You'd be creating lots of, lots of, uh, lots of steam in the kitchen. Okay, too much water. So you want to get rid of the water. You want to bring the concentration of sugar up. So you're going from 98% water inside of that, inside of the sap, two or 3% sugar. And you want to take it Take it to 66% sugar. So I'll show you that uh, later. We'll take a closer look. So the rule of 86, some of you may have heard this. I'm often asked about this. The rule of 86 means if you have a tree species, let's say a sugar maple, that only has 1% sweetness out of all the water, it's going to take 86 gallons to make one gallon of of syrup that the wow okay not so good so double that to two percent sugar and you're already at 43 gallons to make one gallon of syrup and that's a little better so here's sort of a visual here and on average you could say it takes 40 buckets of sap to make one bucket of syrup that's the ratio that's the ratio it's 40 to 1. here's that evaporator pan and it works its way. The sap magically on its own is not pumped through these, these parallel sections here. It flows its way through naturally based on its density, density and increasing concentration of sugar. So it pushes its way through. It's a chemistry thing. Pushes its way through naturally all the way to a point, which is sort of a lower point. But again, this is natural. And we're constantly adding some new sap drip by drip pour by pour just a little at a time because it, we you don't want to pour in a bunch of sap that's cold and ruin the boil we're boiling this we're getting it hot and we're getting it hotter than the boiling point of water and you do a little test here and you pour it into that a stainless steel cup. Oh, we'll look at that later. Here, here is what I meant when I was talking about the density. So you're taking it higher than the, than the temperature of water, uh, that where water boils, because at this point it's not just water. It's not mostly water, and it's it's less and less water, and it's going to have more and more sugar. So it's going to behave differently. It's going to freeze at a lower temperature. It's going to boil at a hotter temperature. So you, you're surpassing. 212 degrees, you're going up to 219 degrees. And the terminology here is bricks. Now, bricks is the sugar content of an aqueous solution, a water solution. So I see I have 66 bricks here, 66 degrees bricks is 66 grams of sucrose in 100 grams of solution. And that represents the strength of the solution as a percentage by mass. Simply put, it's the concentration of sugar, the density, and is a precise way of communicating the sweetness of what's coming out on the bottom right. Look at that. So we pour it out through a filter. Once it hits the 219 degrees, 
We measure it at 66 degrees bricks, show you how, right here. You pour your sample into that stainless steel cup here on the left, which will cost you $15. And you take this bobber over here on the right, that's called a hydrometer, that's only $25. For such a precision instrument, I'd say that's a good price. It's a bobber, you put it in there, you put it in a stainless steel cup, and the way it sits, how, how, how much it sinks, is an indicator of the viscosity of the solution, the viscosity of the syrup, how sweet it is, how dense it is, how heavy and thick it is. And usually the packaging with these hydrometers comes with this little compensation chart for different temperatures because viscosity changes with temperature. Imagine you have some syrup and you spill it onto the snow. It's going to turn into a taffy-like solution. So your heavy syrup needs to be diluted and you know your light syrup, if it, light meaning it's not sugary enough, you have to continue to boil it. These are the supplies for testing it. Pretty easy, right? That stain, that cup on the left, and that I call it a bobber, but yeah, it's a hydrometer over there on the right. And I've given you some companies here. Okay, what about that color and flavor development? All right, there. Here's the secret to the sauce. Here, here's how it tastes and smells so good. It's called the Maillard reaction. That's a non-enzymatic browning reaction. That's a broad term for reactions that result in color and flavor development in food. Caramelization is a nickname for it. It's a chemical reaction. You take your, your sugars and your, your amino acids, and that's what drives it. And it, the more fructose and glucose, and I'll explain that in a second, it, it plus more amino acids, then you have more of the Maillard reaction, okay, and a richer flavor. And that's why late season syrups, which generally have a greater microbial concentration, will have a more intense color and flavor. So what's the deal with microbial concentration? Well, what I mean is the bacteria, the yeast, you know, all these things feed on that sugar and they unpack that sucrose into its parts which are as a fructose and glucose, simpler sugars. So you have more of those around, it's gonna drive this Maillard reaction more. You see, it's gonna do more caramelization. And some of you are thinking, well, that's good, right? Well, that's good. I, I like my syrup to taste like syrup. Well, I'll show you later how it's priced. And it's the opposite of what you would think. The darker and heavier, stronger flavors might be what I put on my waffles this morning to start the day off right. But it's actually what costs less. I'll show you some pictures. Uh, he, by the way, so we've seen this toast down here. That's a non-enzymatic browning rea reaction. So we're, we're throwing heat at the toast. It heats up. Well, what's an enzymatic browning reaction then? That's something like if you cut an apple open and you leave it out, right? What happens? It starts to turn brown. This happens with some mushrooms too, if you cut them open. So, it's an enzymatic reaction. It's driving itself on its own without throwing heat at it. We have these external factors at play. Last year's weather. When is the season? Let me scoot the chat box. When is uh, when in the season the sap was collected? So if you're earlier in the season, the sap buckets might be cleaner. The equipment might be cleaner, and there's going to be less of the, that microbial activity to unpack that sucrose into those constituent parts that are going to drive that Maillard reaction. So it's a balance, you know, you have to have it just right. You don't want plain sap and you don't want your syrup too caramelized. And then how long you're cooking it. Of course, we talked about how that can affect the concentration. You know, simply put, you cook it more, the more and more water is leaving it through steam. That's a very, that's an intuitive, it's an intuitive process there when you see it and smell it happen. You can come check this out at Cleveland Metro Parks. This weekend, we're kicking it off. I, I put the link in the, here, I'll pop it in again, right there. There's the link for this weekend. You can check out the deets. Sugar, sir, the syrup grading that happens here, and this, this is put up by the International Maple Sugar Institute. They put out this grading process. And here's the deal. I have four samples here. These are not my samples. I have these four samples here, and from left to right, do you notice the difference in color? 
it's getting lighter it's from a lighter solution oh moving over to a darker presumably heavier syrup but they're all the same sugar concentration they're all poured off at the 66 brick right at the right temperature the right density of sugar so what you do is you take this tool on the right this photometer that's pricey 280 dollars for that one and you you shoot the little light there that it creates and you see how much light is received on the other side of a small narrow sample it's 10 millimeters in width and that light transmittance through the 10 millimeters is going to give you whoops the grades so if you can get 75 percent of that light wow i've never create produced syrup like that if you can get most of that light more than 75 percent of it through your 10 millimeter sample so your teeny tiny sample then it's expensive it's called fancy and the proper name by the by the imsi group is golden color delicate flavor that sounds intuitive right and i'm giving you all the varieties of names here grade a for a fancy that's its old one of its older names a nickname and it's golden color delicate flavor so now it's color and flavor is how you name these things there we go if you get less than 75 percent but still more than 50 percent of your light transmittance being received then it's amber color rich flavor and get going there here we go dark color robust flavor is between 25 and 50 percent and that's i've created that with my colleagues at Cleveland Metro Parks and our wonderful volunteers. That is a, that is one of the types of syrup that we can reliably produce. The dark color, robust flavor, and it is so tasty. Great bee. What? There we go. A little slower than that. There we go. Now, very dark color, strong flavor. That would be this great, see this commercial, uh, it would be the nickname. And I don't see that too much. And maybe, maybe it's sold at some stores at larger volumes for flavoring. But you see that grade A, dark color, robust flavor. The old name is grade B. That's what you see in stores. That's what I put on my waffles this morning. Here we go. Hey, we're wrapping up here. All right, let's give you some, some context here on how everybody, how everybody fares when they're maybe competing to see who can produce the most well it's canada easily who produces the most that would be gallons there i believe is the unit oh, i don't have that listed and over 10 million gallons this is per year over one year and that's compare that to less than 3 million for the united states moving over to the united states on the right that pie there is a cut of just the United States. So on the right side, take a look at Ohio here. On average, Ohio ranks roughly fifth, and Vermont is is number one. Always number one. They're coming through with maple syrup and good maple syrup. Moving forward, what do we what do we do with all this maple syrup in addition to pouring pouring it on your pancakes? Well. Look at this, look at all the sweet and savory options. And from things that my wife has baked to different cocktails, which I have tried out here, like the bourbon maple and the, um, the, the maple margaritas, okay? I don't know how good that was, but it was worth a try. And the acorn squash, you gotta have your maple syrup on that. Maybe some brown sugar, give it a try. There's some pecan cookies there. Here we go. We are just finishing up. And maple sugaring this year, we're bringing it back to Cleveland Venture Parks. It's on the west side of Cleveland in Rocky River Reservation. You park across the street at Lagoon Picnic Area. We kick it off this weekend, March 6th and 7th. So that's Saturday and Sunday. And then the following weekend, the 13th and the 14th. So maple sugaring will be the first two weekends in March. It's free. There is absolutely no registration required. And you can, again, park at Lagoon Picnic Area across the street. Masks are required. 
I'm peeking through here. I, I don't think we had a lot of questions tonight that I didn't get to right on the spot. But again, I do want to thank you for tuning in. Again, I am Marty Calabrese, a naturalist with Cleveland Metro Parks at North Chagrin Nature Center. And thank you so much. I will see you soon, maybe on the trail, if I don't see you sooner virtually, or maybe I will see you at Maple, Maple Sugaring. Please say hello. Thank you, everybody. Good night.